Well, let's uh, just pause for another word of prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, we turn to your word now and ask for your help, Lord, that you just speak uh, from it, that as it goes out, it will not return void, uh, and that you would receive all the honor and the glory that your name is due. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are continuing in Isaiah, as we've uh, been mentioning earlier. Uh, We're at the fifth chapter, and there are seven verses that we're looking at this morning. So I'm just going to read that now. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a vine, a wine vat in it, and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds, that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Amen. So continuing then in this study of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah is a well, he's, he's taken up by the decline of, of Judah, de- taken up by uh, the decline of Jerusalem and its certain punishment to come. But in the middle of these, uh, some of the verses in these first chapters, we've also seen a, a future restoration a, when all will be as in the days of old, as at the beginning when, when David, King David, uh, captured the fortress of Zion establishing it uh, for his own, establishing it as the kingdom center of all things political and religious for Israel. Uh, Zion or Jerusalem standing, of course, for God's throne. Through these first chapters, though, um, the narrative takes on, a, like a, a, takes on a, the, the, the style of a courtroom scene where the whole of creation bears witness against Israel Uh, A warning had been issued in in Deuteronomy 30 and 32 that if they broke the covenant with the Lord, they would be judged. The Lord set before them life and death, blessing and curse, and exhorted them to choose life in order that they may live, them and their descendants. And we arrive here at these seven verses, and it's in the style of a a, a song. He's singing uh, there, and he's maybe um, gathered a a crowd uh, to sing to them. Uh, Singing uh, can take many, many forms, and we're used to it in our own society. Uh, But gathering a crowd uh, and, and, and delivering the message in a song Uh, It might be favored because the content uh, uh, can be remembered and at least learned, Um, but it is a sad lament of the circumstances that Isaiah describes. Uh, We're going to see in the next minute or two uh, that the vineyard owner is God, as the passage declares, and of course already we know that the vineyard is Israel. Throughout, though, we can summarize into the following points that the vineyard was protected, the vineyard owner expected fruitfulness, 
the vineyard was unfruitful and that there was a message that the vineyard will be destroyed. The vineyard will be redeemed though in the future and the old vineyard rejects the new vine, but the new vine is fruitful. And so the language that's used by Isaiah is similar to that that we might have already seen if we've read through Song of Songs, where he talks about his be beloved. And it's, that, it's just declaring, isn't he, as Isaiah, he has that great love, that God has a great love for him, but he also has a, a love for the Lord. And it's a, 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 in a style similar to that in a sort of poetic language. The lover and his beloved the relationship, intimate relationship between God and Isaiah. The vineyard, first of all, then, is protected. He sings his song, Isaiah, uh, continuing the life song of, of the people of Israel. Starting off well, uh, we, we, we see the picture of the blessing Israel knew with God as their king. They were in a wonderful, privileged position as we read in Psalm 80 earlier, uh, rescued from the bondage of uh, Israel, uh, sorry, Egypt, and eventually living in the land of promise, declared to be a peculiar people, unlike the surrounding nations with the gift of the revelation of God who is gracious and good, and with the very presence of God dwelling in the midst of their camp and eventually in the temple. They were God's people, a people that God called his own. They were set apart for God himself. They had an abundance of good things with which they could offer to God through sacrifices and offerings. And of course, they knew the blessing of these things themselves. The Lord planted the choicest vine, set up a pure religion among them, gave them a most excellent law instituted ordinances and rituals for keep, keeping them right with himself, keeping them right on the right path with God. A tower was built, we're told, perhaps for defense or for vine dressers to stay in, or the owner of the vineyard to, to look out on his vines that he would expect fruit from. We can see that the temple in Israel was this tower where the Lord's priests ministered uh, for the people and where God promised to meet them, gracing the people with his presence and bringing pleasure to himself and blessing his people. He made a wine press, setting up his altar to which the sacrifice and a vat as well, uh, where some of the fruit of the, the vine should be brought. And so we see that they have this protection the vineyard owner, though, expected fruitfulness. Everything was all set up for, the, for them to prosper. He expect, God expected fruitfulness from his vine, Israel, but they turned their back on him and, of course, was told that they will face the consequences. Warned about by Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and others, and even Moses himself put pen to paper, as it were, and wrote a song uh, to be, for the Israelites to learn. And within that, in chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, uh, we can read the song that Moses wrote. And he wrote there that Israel are an unfaithful people, and as such, as we've just heard, will face the judgment of God. Moses said, that their vine comes from the vine of Sodom and from the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of serpents and the cruel venom of asps. Referring to Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses likens the people of Israel and their fruit worthy of, treat, of the, the treatment of those destroyed cities by God's falling fiery wrath that we read about or can read about in Genesis. 
Israel's unfaithfulness and false gods brought evil deeds and a poisonous fruit worthy of the destruction by God. We, we have seen that God blessed them with his presence and protected them from the pagan nations around them who hated them and wanted to destroy Israel. The clearing away, it's interesting just saying that, it's such a, a current theme still. The clearing away of stones from the fertile hill speaks of the vine dresser making the soil ready or maintaining the ground in order that the vine has the best chance for growth and fruitfulness. The surrounding nations were cleared out by the Lord's hand, making the land of Canaan a secure and flourishing place for God's people to settle down into. Canaan was the promised land, of a land flowing with milk and honey. The possibility for abundant fruitfulness was set about, was brought about by the Lord himself. But the people looked around at the surrounding nations and coveted their ways, wanted something like what they had, a king uh, that they wanted for themselves. They cried to be like those nations and wanted a king they could call their own blind to the fact that they already had a wonderful situation, completely ignoring and snubbing the Lord, their awesome king of righteousness. Their actions was not just no fruit, it was stinking bad fruit. They would intermarry, eh, warned against that, with the surrounding nations adopting their pagan practices when the Lord had warned them that such behavior would end in exile. And so eventually the Lord would make the way open for the surrounding nations who wanted a piece of Israel to attack and to slaughter and plunder and carry them off to foreign lands in shame and disgrace into exile. The, the devouring and trampling mentioned in the passage eh, is as a result of the hedge and wall of protection removed by the Lord will happen continually until Jerusalem is completely destroyed. And so we see that the vineyard will be destroyed. The Lord removed the border protection and no longer pruned and cultivated the land, allowing sin's curse of the ground mentioned in Genesis in the form of thorns and briars to grow up, hindering and strangling the once thriving vine. It will be desolated, allowing the curse of thorns to grow in the land and calling the clouds to hold back so no rain would fall. Only God uh, could do such a thing. Holding back the rain would choke the ground, uh, longing for that much needed moisture. But the barrenness picture, rather than thriving growth brought about, was by their own disobedience and their own unfaithfulness. It is the fault of the vine, not the vine dresser. Um, and so we see that everything God could do to set out a beautiful land where the vine could grow and be fruitful, instead, Israel produced wild grapes and bitter fruit. The rain being removed, that is, that is a curse in a land that longed for rain to, to come and help them with their harvest, having the rain not come. In other words, having the rain removed, that was a, a curse that they produced. Bitter fruit uh, worthy of the fiery rubbish tip outside the city. The question, though, halfway through the passage is asked of the men of Judah and Israel, wondering what more could have been done and it's now not Isaiah singing about his beloved God. It's, it's Isaiah. He changes over the, the course of the passage that God is actually speaking. And it's really the Lord that's asking the men of Israel, what more could I have done? Maybe in there, uh, they, and they didn't recognize that what was being displayed was a picture of their own disobedience. And maybe in their eagerness to respond, it might be something similar to the, the, the Pharisees in Jesus' day when they would want to answer uh, uh, and not realize that the fault lay 
with the vine and that punishment would be deserved and they would be brought into a trap really and, and, and self-fulfilling uh, what would befall them as the unfaithful vine, the men of Judah. A sad, sad song. The vineyard will be redeemed in the future though. To get some counter to this uh, song or, or lament or a song of a parable of the fruitless vine, we can jump forward in Isaiah. Now, it might be some weeks <laughs> or months before we get to uh, Isaiah 27, um, where we are as a hint of the redemption of Israel. But in those passages there, uh, the first six verses, in fact, I'll just read a couple of them there from chapter 27. Uh, in that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it, another song, a different song this time. We've been looking so far at the lament uh, over Israel's disobedience. And here, uh, the Lord saying, I am the vineyard's keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it day and night. And then on to verse 6 there in 27 says, in days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. And of course, we as believers today are the fruit of Jesus, the vine, his suffering. We'll come to that in a minute or two, but that, that's, uh, we, are, we are part of that fruit that's throughout the whole world. But that stark contra contrast to the vine that we've looked at, this vineyard is fruitful. Where our passage spoke of how Israel had ruined their relationship with the Lord as his vineyard and were to blame and should be justly punished. In the future here, the Lord does the work himself and it is marvelous work. Jesus says a lot about that when he speaks of uh, the master of a house planting a vineyard in Matthew 21, where we see the old vineyard we've been talking about rejecting the new vine. And Jesus speaks of that here, where a master of a house planted a vineyard, putting a fence around it. And it's just very similar language to what we've just read uh, in Isaiah 5. Uh, digging a wine press in it. This is Jesus speaking in Matthew building a tower and he leased it out to tenants. The master goes off uh, to another country and returned at the season for the fruit, sending his servants to get his fruit. The tenants, though, of the vineyard mistreated the servants. The master sent a further group of servants and they were also mistreated by the tenants. Deciding that they would respect his son, the master of the vineyard sent his son to retrieve the fruit. But the tenants thought if they killed the heir to the vineyard, then the inheritance would be theirs. So they killed him. Jesus asked the scribes and Pharisees listening to him in Matthew 21, that's in 33 to 44. He asked these scribes, what should the owner do to the tenants? Just a wee bit like how the Lord was asking the men of Judah, what more could have been done? Jesus is asking the scribes what these tenants, sh should, what should happen to them? What should the, the owner should do to the tenants? And in their haste to answer, they failed to see that the parable was directed at them and confirmed their own fate by suggesting the owner might put these wretches to a miserable death and let the vineyard out to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Of course, here again, the landowner is God, as we were hearing in uh, Isaiah, and the vineyard is the kingdom of God. The servants are the godly prophets of the Old Testament. The son is Jesus himself and the tenants are the Jewish leaders who opposed Jesus as the true Messiah. 
And of course, the killing of the owner's son speaks of Jesus' crucifixion. The removing of the wicked tenants is the transferring of the kingdom to a new people of God that includes the Gentiles, a, a, a people led by the apostles who are the tenants who will give him the fruit in their season, and that is the church, and we are part of that today. Jesus also quotes in the close of that parable in Matthew from Psalm 118, a messianic parable about the stone the builders rejected becoming the chief cornerstone. We sang the song Cornerstone this morning, the Lord's doing again, speaking of Jesus, and it's marvelous in our eyes, Jesus said, they are quoting from Psalm 118, speaking, of course, directly of his death and resurrection. Jesus was declaring to the scribes listening that the son who was killed and thrown out of the vineyard was also the chief cornerstone in God's redemptive plan. God's plan of salvation eh, brought about by God himself and his son, the Christ, is at the center of the narrative. It's all about Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees would be livid to learn that he was talking of himself, further fueling the fire of their hatred in their hearts for Jesus. Of course, they would go on to plan his demise. More stinking fruit of the old vine on display in the scribes and Pharisees. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah, the old vine rejecting the new vine making way for the Gentiles to come in, to be grafted in to the new vine. God is doing something new, a new vine, a true vine, replacing Israel as the old vine. Where it failed, the new vine will, be, will flourish, as we'll see in a moment. Ezekiel says, Thus says the Lord God, like the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so have I given up the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will set my face against them. Though they escape from the fire, the fire shall yet consume them, and you will know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them, and I will make the land desolate, because they have acted faithlessly, declares the Lord God." We're now going to see that the new vine is fruitful. And Peter, speaks of, uh, speaking to the, the Christian believers, says, but you, Christian believers, are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And as we looked at this morning in Galatians, Paul says, now, we didn't look at this part, first of all. We looked at the, the fruit, which we'll see in a second. But Paul warns, he says, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, Paul says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And now, as we finally look at what Jesus is saying about the new vine, he says in John chapter 15, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. 
Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear fruit. I'm just reminded there uh, of the, the type of pruning that I used to do with an amazing uh, rose bush that we had down in Drumrye Road. A wee bit um, also in uh, Foswell as well, but um, not to the same extent. But I used to go in there with the secateurs, whatever you call them, and really, I mean, it was, <laughs> the flowers had fallen off, right? And the thing was huge. I used to bring it right down and Tina would be quite upset that we're thinking that would be the end of it. But it used to come up the following season and amazing, big, huge, yellowy, creamy uh, roses were amazing. But here, Jesus says that his father is the vine dresser and he's the one that does the pruning, God expected fruitfulness from his vine. And the only way to be fruitful is to be attached to the vine, that the life comes through the vine. And as believers and followers of Christ, we are in Christ by the new birth. We are attached by faith, by his spirit to Christ. In order to be fruitful, we must follow Christ. Maintain a close walk with him. Don't strive to manufacture behavior, but rest in the presence of Christ. Have a close walk with him. Not striving to behave, but uh, walking with Jesus. And the one who abides in him will bring forth the fruitfulness of uh, that the Father is looking for the fruit of the Spirit of God. The Father prunes the branches. He sees the unfruitfulness of those claiming to be in Christ. They are cut off by God the Father, the vine dresser. He knows and sees a person's heart. We look out, we can't see what's actually going on in our hearts, but God sees. He knows his own and knows those who are counterfeit branches. They produce no fruit and are pruned off. Fruitfulness follows those who are in the vine. Good fruit that we were speaking of earlier is produced by the Lord doing a new marvelous thing in the lives of the new people of God. The new vine is Christ himself, and we are the branches in the vine of Christ. Someone saying they are in Christ but has no real uh, born-again conversion experience. Um, so therefore, no transforming work of the Holy Spirit in their lives as found in someone who truly is converted might not ever be known by us, as I was just saying there. God knows, though. But they are missing out on such a wonderful, fruitful life that is to, that's to be enjoyed in the Lord Jesus. The peace that comes from knowing Him. Can't, no one can manufacture that. Why pretend when the, the, the genuine article is so marvelous? A wretched sinner can be cleansed, their sin not counted against them, trusting in the Savior, Jesus, for salvation. Knowing the fellowship and communion with the Lord Himself, it's amazing that a sinner can be in the presence of God and not be smitten due to their stinking rags of so-called righteousness. That's what our good deeds are like. The old vine produced stinking fruit. Those attached to Jesus in the new true vine will produce good fruit that will last. He said, you will know them by their fruit. God did do something new in bringing Gentiles into the family of God and others, of course, as well, allowing us to be called his people, his peculiar People, his precious people, a, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. 
that we might produce good fruit which will glorify God, which will tell of His excellent Word, proclaim the goodness of God in order to become grafted into the true vine. We need our sin dealt with by trusting in the Lord for the forgiveness of our sin, believing in Jesus the Messiah, unlike the Pharisees who did not believe that Jesus was uh, the true Messiah of God, didn't believe that He was the God-man. And of course, in doing so, brought on themselves further or judgment to come. So we need to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and we need to believe that He is God. And in, in so doing, we ex are accepted in, brought out of the darkness of our old hearts and into the light of His kingdom, the Son in whom He loves. We are heirs and co-heirs with Christ, citizens of God's kingdom, branches producing good fruit by the Spirit of God dwelling within us, a work of God, not of Mark trying his best or of man, but a fruitfulness produced in us by God Himself. Where before the Israelites eh, brought about their own demise, brought about their own judgment, they couldn't, eh, they couldn't be obedient to the law. And so God had to do something new, had to do something marvelous. And so that is what we see today in Jesus. Does he see fruitfulness in you? Is it because you don't truly know the Lord yet? Are you among us, but not truly one of us? Reach out to the Lord this morning. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to follow Him. It's not enough just to believe in Him. It's believe in Him and follow Him. That's the evidence that you're born again. That's the evidence that you're a branch in the vine, that there's fruitfulness. You're abiding in Christ. You're, you're following Christ. It's not about being perfect in our behavior. It's a direction. It's a journey that we're on. A journey of growth of the, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, driven by the Spirit of Christ Himself. We are a privileged people living in days of grace. Let's not sin eh, that grace should abound, but let's stay close to the Master. Abide in Him and He will be glorified. The proof that we are His disciples is producing fruit of the Spirit of Christ as branches in the true vine and glorifying God. The new vine, Jesus, produced and is producing much fruit and continues to. He brings many people to salvation, and that brings glory to God. And so may we be part of what God is doing by uh, walking closely with the Lord and being in the vine and producing fruit, allowing God to produce the fruit in us, the branches of the vine. Amen. Let's have a, a word of prayer before we sing again. Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we just bless you this morning that we have been brought into the family of God, that it was a wonderful and marvelous work of salvation that has been done. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we know you, Lord, because of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that because of who Jesus is and what he did, we are the fruit of his suffering. We are children of God, children of the, God, of the Lord Most High, and we worship you, Lord. We, we bless you and we give thanks, Lord. But we pray, Lord, if we're struggling today, that we would say that we're sorry and we'll, we'll come back to you, Lord, and, and just allow you to have your way among us, that you might produce in us fruit that will last, that we allow you, sit at your feet, allow you to prune away what is not right in our lives. It might be that we are looking around at the, the nations around. We're looking around at the world, envying what they have, 
secretly wishing that we could be a bit like that. So Lord, help us as we sit at your feet that you might prune, Lord. But Lord, we, we pray that you would be gentle with us. Help us in our weakness. But Lord, we, we want to flourish for you. We want to uh, produce fruit that will last. And the, of course, the only way to do that is allow you, the Holy Spirit of God, to do that work that no other can do. And so, Lord, we want to give you the honor and the glory today, asking these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.